Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Swutsky. I'm from Tuplux AI. And together with my team, we are working on a, a model using multiple modalities to analyze uh, video content. I will be talking about a few different things. So to make it more clear, here's a little agenda. But firstly, I will introduce you to the problem so you can feel what we was feeling at the beginning. And uh, later, I'll tell you about the data, about um, modalities that we are using, how the project evolved to the point uh, where we decided to use multiple modalities, how we combine them. And finally, we will tell you, uh, tell you about some technical issues that we had and how we solved them. So everything started this year's uh, spring when Nick, the head of uh, video editors from media company that we work for, asked us if we can produce an automated solution that would tell him what he should not include in his videos so more people watch them till the end. Uh, so here we have an example. There are some uh, five, four types of food. Some look better, some are less visually appealing, like for example that drunken chicken uh, marked with the red frame. So basically what Nick wanted us, to, uh, wanted us to do was to analyze thousands of Facebook videos and uh, tell him that he should not show drunken chicken, tuna, set cats, etc. Unfortunately, we can't tell Nick that, we, uh, that he can't show anything and that r drunken chicken is responsible for anything because we can't analyze causation. But what we can do uh, is to analyze the uh, correlation between what was shown in videos and the retention data. And uh, what is retention data? There may be slightly different definitions, but uh, in our project we've used this one, which is a fraction of viewers watching video over time. So let's say that 100 uh, people start watching a video and in the next point, only 50 of them are still watching, so the retention at this point is 0 0.5. I told you that uh, we can analyze correlations. Uh, so what kind of correlations? We have videos, which are in fact a bunch of static images called uh, video frames. So we want to take these video frames, apply a neural network, and predict some retention data. So we have retention problem here that we want, regression problem that we want here to solve. And here's the actual retention data from Facebook. Maybe it's n not exactly important here what it means. Uh, I will tell you later about this. But what is important here is uh, the, the general feeling about the data. So at the beginning, you have really sharp drop, which is expected because when people watch Facebook movies, they need some time to decide if they are anyway interested in this movie. And if they are not, they'll just scroll down to the other video. And later, this magnitude of drop uh, decreases for a while. And then you have second sharp drop, which you don't want because it means that uh, before that drop, something happened something that uh, people who were already interested in the video didn't like. So our, our idea was to uh, find such points and mark them for Nick. Easier said than done because what uh, Facebook gives us. Facebook divides videos into 41 equal parts and reports number of views for each of these parts. And then of course divides uh, these numbers by, the total, by total number of views which, by the way, you find in the official documentation for unknown reasons. We had to ask uh, Facebook developers uh, directly to get this information. So what we have, we have uh, 41 uh, discrete uh, points, but uh, we want to analyze specific places in videos. So we, in fact, need uh, continuous data. Uh, so now it seems obvious that we should uh, use somehow uh, some kind of interpolation, but it took us a while before we uh, moved to that point and forget about Facebook format for good. So we already have continuous data, but still there are some problems because to tell that uh, a retention drop is high or low, we have to compare it to something. And it's not uh, clear what we should actually compare. 
because first problem is that people may beha behave differently depending on what part of video they're watching. As you said before, at the beginning, we may expect some large drops, but we don't want them towards the end of the video. Uh, so we can't create any kinds of threshold and say that above a given number, uh, drop is large, but below is acceptable. And the second problem is that uh, videos may have different lengths. So we can't compare first second of uh, 30 second videos to the first second of two hours video because they are basically different entities. And naturally we can't use raw data for spa from Facebook for um, the same two reasons. So the actual uh, procedure was quite uh, complex. Uh, so here we've got uh, simplification. So let's say that we have some point of the interest and the retention value at this point is 0 0.7. So you, we calculate a retention drop from that point. And then we calculate retention drop from uh, drops from the same retention value for all other videos in our data set, which gives us uh, some distribution. And then we can just uh, find, in w find in which uh, percentile our drop uh, calculated in the first step is placed. So what it gives us is that we can assign each point uh, of the interest to some value from range of from zero to 100. And if it's not clear, then sorry, <laughs> it's my fault. Okay, so you already know what kind of target variable we have. And now let's talk about uh, the input data. Uh, so we have uh, videos, which at the very end are just static images that we can analyze separately. So the image is our first modality, but on these images we also have uh, some text which tells uh, stories. And we initially thought that these texts are even more important than visual information. But unfortunately, our client don't have uh, this text in any editable format, so we had to create our own in-house solution to extract this text from images, which uh, posed some problems because there were spelling mistakes and it's a little bit uh, hard problem to analyze videos to extract text from them. Okay, before moving further, we performed some basic experiments to check what, what we can achieve with single modalities and if there's any benefit in combining them. So as you can see, when we are using uh, outputs from regressors trained on individual modalities, so we achieved uh, um, better results. But uh, before we decided to actually combine these modalities and use both of them, uh, we focused only on text. Uh, so we had an idea that we may find some phrases or even individual words that are correlated with bad or good retention. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, we tried to group words, uh, text associate, associated with better retention and with good retention and then extracted keywords from them and tried to compare them manually. But we couldn't find any meaningful uh, patterns in there. So at this point, uh, we decided to use also images. But still, even for human, it may be difficult to decide if a given image with uh, single text is anyway related to some kind of retention. So in the final solution, uh, we decided to use uh, sequences of images and text, which is our final input. Okay, so we already know that we want to describe our data points with two types of data, uh, which is, and for text part, we have uh, a vector from fast text to elevate for this, uh, from these misspellings uh, from OCR. And from the image, we have uh, features from ResNet 50 network. But still, we have two vectors, and we need only one. So we have to combine them somehow. And what we can do? The easiest thing that we can do is to just concatenate two vectors, or so glue them together to achieve uh, one long vector, which is very straightforward and easy to implement. 
but there are some problems. The first problem is that uh, we make our data m more sparse, so we, in fact, should use much larger data set to make it uh, work uh, well. And uh, the other problem is that our model can't learn any meaningful relations between these features. But still, you can use this approach to train uh, some basic models of, so for example, fit uh, SVM uh, with this vector. What we can do better is to add another layer to that concatenated vector, which is multi-layer perceptron, which uh, can combine these features for us in some nonlinear way. And then we can use that representation to train our regressor. And it's uh, efficient and works quite well, but still we wanted uh, something more fancy. So we implemented a solution from last year's paper called TensorFusion, which here you've got in simplified version. So the idea, idea is that you have two or more vectors. You append values of uh, one to them. And it's a very important step because uh, when you later calculate outer product of these vectors, the resulting matrix or tensor, on the edges you have your original vectors and in the middle you have uh, linear combinations of these vectors. So your model can learn to put more wave to any of the input or uh, combinations of them. And it's also very easy to train and uh, efficient solution. Another, uh, another solution that you can use is uh, autoencoder. Uh, so it works like you have two vectors, you first concatenate uh, them and on the output you want your original vectors back so that uh, hidden layer should learn, should encode information in a compact way in, s in such that you can actually retrieve original information from it. So it sounds that that hidden layer should make perfect uh, feature vector for your model. So here's our final solution. Uh, it's a little bit com more complex than that diagram that you've seen before because we are using sequential data so we had to somehow um, modify that idea to join together to operate on four dimensional data and uh, join them together and uh, of course you can also train your regressor simultaneously with it with this architecture by just uh, using additional output from that uh, combined modalities layer. And it, uh, only drawback of this solution is that it uh, takes a long time to train. And also what you can use in your project is that uh, if you have uh, some values in a specific range at the output, it may be a good idea to actually modify activation function from the last layer so your model directly predicts uh, values in a range that you want. And it's easy to, that, to do that. So we compared our models using cross-validation, which I highly recommend because it prevents from overfitting to the uh, training uh, set. Uh, but of course, it, it takes more time. Okay. And still, it's important to have uh, some test set that you don't touch to the very end. And as you can see, outer encoder worked uh, the best and concatenation gave us uh, even worse results than uh, simple models trained on separated modalities. So the conclusion here is that if you have uh, multiple sources of data that are somehow complementary, it's a good idea to try to use them all but uh, simple concatenation may be not enough and you should experiment with some more sophisticated ways on combining or mixing them together. And as uh, promised, here are some technical issues that we had. Maybe the first one isn't uh, so uh, surprising for you because uh, today's uh, data sets are really large and they rarely uh, fit into the memory. But still, if you run into this problem, I recommend using HDF5 file format 
and the generators to read uh, data by by batch from disk. You can even do some processing in these generators and it uh, still should l work quite uh, efficiently. Another problem which was really unexpected was uh, Google Cloud Platform maintenance policy because our virtual machine was being restarted quite often so we couldn't finish training in the one run. Uh, Actually, if Google gives you $300 to try out their solutions, so uh, it's worth remembering if you want to use your uh, money for uh, something meaningful. And uh, of course, uh, we are using checkpoints, but still it was uh, very troublesome to restore experiments manually. For example, you wanted to uh, run some experiments over, over the weekend. And uh, on Monday, we discovered that nothing uh, happened actually. So we're wasting time. And the solution here was to use checkpoints and Docker Compose to automatically rerun our containers with experiments after each reboot. And uh, the final problem that we unfortunately had was representativity of our research. Uh, we were generating many data sets and experiments and we couldn't in fact, uh, recreate them later, uh, which is probably a general problem in the research community. Uh, we tried um, some automated solutions, but uh, they didn't work very well. And what worked well was, in fact, creating manual readme files for each data file generated, which combined with uh, dockerized environment, uh, environment and uh, uh, source control version um, allowed us to restore each experiment and uh, recreate each data set that we've created before. And also important is to actually not only implementing this uh, solution, but to check if every, everyone is following these new rules. So someone has to check if these readme files are actually being created. And uh, thanks to my very fast uh, speaking abilities, <laughs> this is the last slide, and thank you for your attention. And if you would like to join our team, we are hiring, so check out the website or contact me directly. So thank you. We have some space for questions. Uh, so on the model diagram, uh, you've shown that you um, merge those two modalities uh, only after processing all of the frames by the LSTM, correct? Uh, you mean that slide? Yes. Uh, yes, so we are merging, in fact, uh, LSTM representations of these uh, input features, vectors. Okay, so uh, have you tried to instead... Um, merge those two modalities for every frame separately and then running this through the LSTM? Mm, I guess uh, not. It was probably uh, when you're creating this uh, architecture, I think uh, additional LSTM features are important to, uh, important from rather a technical context. I think it's, they were not needed conce conceptually, but uh, Technically, to make this architecture work, we needed that additional STM features after uh, input vectors. Okay, good. One more. Okay. Uh, hello, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question. You you had a table comparing the results of some methods, okay. and this I want one? yes yes. And I wanted to ask you, <coughs> um, can you provide some intuitions why some methods uh, did better, why some methods did worse? What was the, like the what decided that? Okay, uh, of course I can uh, rephrase that concatenation made our data even more sparse. So we simply. Uh, had not enough uh, data points to make the solution work good. That's why the results are so uh, so bad. 
uh, and uh, uh, other architectures were becoming uh, gradually more complex. Um, so I think it's just uh, quality of representation of these two modalities which decided that uh, some results are better. So in fact, in autoencoder, we have very good representation of these uh, multimodal features. And that's why our regressors learn to, correlate, to find these correlations uh, better than other architectures.